So I'm going to focus primarily on incorporation of BRAF targeted therapy into neuro-oncology clinical practice. So this will be a pretty practically based talk, focusing on how to use these treatments for our patients. And so my three main objectives are to recognize which alterations we should be targeting, to identify which drugs we should be using for which alteration, and to think about how we should be treating toxicities in our patients. And so I think by this point, most of us have seen, or at least heard about a patient like this. This is a patient I saw during fellowship. who's 34, he had multiple lines of therapy and recurred on all of them. And then he started on dibrafenib and trametinib. And you can see here his enhancing and his flare disease really melted away over the course of 14 months. And so he did remarkably well on dibrafenib and trametinib for quite a long time. And this is exciting. We don't have a lot of great options for recurrent high-grade glioma that has progressed on multiple lines of therapy. And so BRF alterations do occur commonly in a subset of glioma. We know that the V600 mutation, the one that we think of most commonly as being targetable, is common in PXA and in ganglioglioma, but it also occurs in a subset, small but consistent, of pediatric and adult astrocytoma. One of the other BRF alterations you'll hear me talking about today a little later is the fusions, and these are also very common in pilocytic astrocytoma. And if you put the numbers together, you can see that almost all pilocytic astrocytomas have some alteration in BRAF. And so I'm going to take one little pause. This is one of the only signaling pathways I'll show you this talk, but it's really important to understand how mutant BRAF works. And we understand that by understanding how physiologic RAS and RAF signaling work. And so what happens in a normal cell is that ligand binds to a receptor tyrosine kinase. That receptor tyrosine kinase through a multiple scaffold proteins activates RAS from its inactive GDP bound form to GTP bound form. That then recruits RAF to the surface where it dimerizes. You can have homo or heterodimers of BRAF, ARAF, and CRAF. And these then activate MEC and ERK and intracellular signaling, leading to cell proliferation um, and all sorts of things. Okay. Now, there are many different mutations that can happen in BRAF. The one we think of most commonly, V600E, is an activating monomeric mutation. So that means if you take mutant BRAF and drop it into a cell, it by itself is sufficient as an oncogene to activate ERK, ERK signaling. There are many other BRAF alterations that don't act quite the same way, but can also be oncogenic. And we divide these into two groups, class two and class three. And both of them occur in glioma. So class two don't need RAS, right? So BRAF by itself is where the activation starts but they do need to dimerize. So they're not able to be active all by themselves. There need to be two around. Um, so they don't need active rest, but they do need to dimerize. And this is a list of some of the class two BRAF alterations one might expect to find, particularly of note for glioma is this bottom one here, fusions of the BRAF kinase domain. So these are those um, uh, BRAF fusions that we think about in pilocytic astrocytomas. The other class is class three, and these are BRF alterations that are dependent on dimerization, yes, but they need activation of upstream RAS. And so this could be through a RAS mutation, not very common in glioma, or through loss of NF1. As we heard earlier from Dr. Romo's talk, very common in a certain subset of, of patients with neurofibromatosis, but also very common in glioblastoma in general, right? Um, often see loss of NF1. You can also see activation or mutation of receptor tyrosine kinases. And so these BRAF mutants um, cause the BRAF and either BRAF or CRAF molecules to stay bound together longer so that activation can continue downstream. Okay. And I realize there's a lot of, of uh, molecular biology here, but it becomes relevant in just a minute. The one aside I will say is that not all of the BRAF mutations that we find are going to be pathogenic. And so here you see a lollipop plot where each little lollipop is one or more mutations that we have identified in a glioma. And you can see that V600E is common in that group. But you can also see these, these yellow and green mutations. These are class two and class three, sort of clustered in regions that make sense in the kinase domain. But then you see all of these mutations found in the linkage domain or the N-terminal domain that are not pathogenic. Um, and this is really important to think about. So targeting those mutations is unlikely to produce any beneficial effect for the patient because these mutations are not activating uh, RAF signaling in those cells. 
And so if we look at about 300 adults with BRAF mutations, what mutations do we see? A lot of them are uh, BRAF V600E mutations. We also see class two, class three, and fusions in adults, as well as gains and other mutations of unclear significance. I will point out that some of the fusions we identified actually were in glioblastoma or high-grade astrocytoma, not just in pilocytics. So it's important to look, it's important to ask the question if we're gonna be able to have a therapeutic option for these patients. Okay, and so what treatments are we gonna think about? So I talked briefly, for wild-type BRAF to be active, you need BRAF to dimerize with another BRAF molecule or a CRAF molecule or an ARAF molecule, and that activates downstream signaling. BRAF V600E is sufficient by itself to activate downstream signaling. And so there are an array of drugs that are FDA approved for BRAF V600E, right? These are the monomer selective RAF inhibitors, VEM, dibrafenib, and carafenib, and paired MEK inhibitors. Um, these will be effective against mutant BRAF only. When you think about class two or three mutations, fusions or wild type BRAF, you cannot think about these drugs. In general, we think about these drugs as making it more likely for wild type BRAF to um, find a partner and bind. Um, so they can paradoxically increase ERK signaling in cells that don't have a V600E mutation. And so for patients with these mutations, one might consider a dimer disruptor, something that interrupts this pairing, a pan-RAF inhibitor, something that's gonna be effective against any of these RAF molecules or a MEK inhibitor, either alone or in combination as Dr. Romo referred to earlier. And so how do we pick the right drug? Which drugs should we be using? How well do they work in these patients? Um, so there was a study that was done of uh, venurafenib monotherapy was sort of the first one, a basket study included about 24 patients with BRAF V600E mutations. And you can see here, the response rate for PXA was highest at 43%, for glioma was, uh, malignant glioma was lowest at 9%. But what I'll show you on this SIMRS plot, which I think is really nicely illustrated, even though these tumors didn't shrink, patients lived longer than they should have um, with a recurrent high-grade glioma. Um, so this was exciting. And, and these data have been further substantiated with the ROAR trial. This is Novartis's drugs, dibrafenib and trametinib in high-grade and in low-grade glioma. And we can see that even in GBM, the response rate, like tumor shrinking, is 31%. These patients had a heterogeneous treatment history. Most of them had gotten radiation, sort of standard first-line therapy, but not all. Um, but, but still, in, in the recurrent high-grade glioma setting, a 31% response rate for GBM is pretty exciting. And again, all of these patients had BRAF V600E mutations. In low-grade glioma, the cohort is smaller, 13 patients, but the clinical benefit and response rate were large. And again, clinical benefit, that's the patient population who maybe didn't have their tumor shrink, but didn't have any progression for a whole lot longer than they should have given, um, given the situation. This has been true in pediatric glioma as well. There are a, a bevy of studies that have been published or presented looking at vemurafenib or dibrafenib alone, or the combination, or even selumetinib alone in recurrent low-grade glioma. And in all of these, we see response rates of about a third and stable disease or clinical benefit. In the vast majority, you're seeing numbers of 85 to 100% in these pediatric gliomas. And you can see all of these studies really were sort of under age 21, really what we think about as the pediatric population. And so what's the recommendation right now? Well, the NCCN actually has guidelines for this. And what they've said is that if you have a patient with a new low-grade glioma and you would be considering a treatment for them, think about a BRAF-targeted therapy. The two combinations that they have listed, dibrafenib and trametinib, vemurafenib, cobimetinib, or if it's a pilocytic astrocytoma, remember most of those are driven by the fusion, think about selumetinib, MEK inhibitor monotherapy. For other low-grade glioma and high-grade glioma that are recurrent, if they have this V600 mutation, think about targeted therapy at recurrence. Now, the uh, expert opinion commentary I'll add to that is we really don't have a lot of data in glioma to support vemurafenib and cobimetinib. I don't ever choose this combination if I can help it. Um, the brain metastasis data uh, were quite a bit weaker for that combination in melanoma. Um, and so I would choose dibrafenib and trametinib or encorafenib and binimetinib over vemurafenib and cobimetinib if I had the option. Uh, additionally, some of the combinations have a different toxicity profile. So you might consider encorafenib and binimetinib for intolerable toxicity. What if your patient falls outside of this sort of strict 
um, definition here, you're looking for other options, clinical trials, there are a lot of them right now. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them. I'm happy to share these slides with anyone who would like it as a reference. But um, I think the thing to point out here is studies are looking at a lot of different combinations. Almost all of these studies are in pediatric glioma, but you can see um, our, our pediatric neuro-oncology colleagues are, are expanding their definition for good reason um, in, in these tumor types and, and going up to even age 30. And I, I know during Dr. Romo's talk, the question came up, well, what about some of these other mutations? What about pairing it with other therapies? So you can see there's one interesting trial going on right now, looking at giving radiation six weeks, followed by dibrafenib and trametinib immediately after in young adults and children with high-grade glioma. Um, and then you can see that there is another here that is comparing selumetinib against standard chemotherapy in, in children with untreated or recurrent low-grade glioma. So people are starting to look at the efficacy in combination or compared to uh, standard of care chemotherapy. You can also look that we have some exciting new drugs, such as this PANRAF inhibitor, day 101 in low-grade glioma. Uh, what if your patient doesn't have a V600 mutation? You can see some of these trials here um, will include any low-grade glioma in NF1 or an activating BRF alteration. I would also say the things that you should consider in patients with other BRF mutations, if they're class two, class three, or fusions, MEK inhibitor monotherapy, one of these novel BRAF inhibitors like the day 101 drug or other dimer disruptors, a PANRAF inhibitor, or a SHIP2 inhibitor. There are a lot of trials going on now. Um, that's one of the scaffold proteins that goes up between the receptor tyrosine kinase and RAS. And so there are uh, several trials that are open right now. Some of them don't include um, C prime, uh, active CNS disease. This one here is tremendous hydroxychloroquine for low-grade glioma only, um, and some other combinations looking at new RAF inhibitors or SHIP inhibitors with MEK inhibitors that are promising for patients with these activating BRAF mutations that aren't B600E. And so the last thing I really wanted to make sure I focused on today in talking about these drugs in this class is toxicity, recognition, and management. And so here I've given you a pictorial guide of the things to remember and thinking of, think about when you start a patient on these drugs, when you're talking about them. So with MEK inhibitors, there's this classic rash. Uh, we worry about cardiomyopathy. Um, with combinations, we think about serous retinopathy um, or uh, retinal vein occlusions. Um, we can think about secondary skin malignancies, squamous and basal cell carcinoma. And then fatigue can be a big one and, and fevers, particularly with RAF inhibitors, as well as some uh, toxicities uh, to muscles and to the liver that we might find through, through blood testing. And, and so this is, this is not a trivial concern. So more than 90% of patients have toxicity on these drugs and 50 to 70% have grade three or four toxicity. So this is serious. It's not that your patients are gonna start them and be 100% fine. Although I would say my experience has been that young adults tend to tolerate them better than older adults. Um, despite the high, high rate of toxicity, only about 10% of patients have to stop drugs for toxicity. And, and I think this is for a couple of reasons. Um, patients don't often have a lot of other options when they when they got to this phase as part of the early melanoma clinical trials, at least. And this these data are from melanoma, the toxicity data. I think what we see in glioma is similar. Uh, but I think what this does say is that anticipatory guidance, um, prophylaxis are critical. I, I will also say most toxicity occurs soon after initiation, particularly those first few weeks. So again, anticipatory guidance, prescribing some prophylactics along with the targeted therapy and having close and available contact in the clinic are absolutely critical to ensure patients can start them effectively and stay on them um, as, as long as, as they are of benefit. Um, and so some of the, the tips in thinking about using these drugs, um, you can start at a reduced dose, a minus one dose level and up titrate over a week or two to see how the patient does, give them a chance to adapt. Um, use dose interruptions, use dose reductions. Um, there, I think, is a lot of flexibility in dosing, and you can often re-escalate once patient symptoms are, are under control and, and you've figured out how to make it tolerable. Uh, and then also, I would consider switching within a class um, for severe toxicity. And so, um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of toxicities. 
this is not here for you to remember them all, but I did want to just point out some of the most common toxicities with each of these combinations. And so you can see there's a lot of phototoxicity um, and then more GI stuff with this them kobe combination. Fever is a particularly common toxicity of dibrafenib and trametinib and, and probably the most common reason I switch off of this combination to, to something else. Um, and, and then um, I would say with encorafenib and binimetinib, particularly as compared to dibrafenib and trametinib, there's a lot of CPK elevations. So that might be a reason to switch back to dibrafenib and trametinib. Um, and then for peripheral and edema or decreased EF, you might think about encorafenib and binimetinib. So just things to th keep in mind as you're trying to help patients through, um, through the toxicity period. Okay, and so I realize this is a bit of a whirlwind tour. A uh, couple of take home points I want to leave you with today. So RAF, MEC, or combination therapy can be very effective. I think it's exciting um, for, for those of us who have been in neuro-oncology and have seen many treatments that aren't effective. Um, however, uh, it really depends on the mutation. And so molecular tumor board, the NGS report, or a curbside is absolutely critical in, in selecting the right treatment. Um, I would definitely just make myself available if anybody ever wanted to reach out about sort of an unusual BRAF mutation and, and trying to think about whether and which targeted therapy might be effective. I'm more than happy to field uh, curbsides like that. Um, and then lastly, but very importantly for our patients, toxicity is really common, but can be um, totally ameliorated and, and the patient can be supported through that process um, with appropriate uh, guidance from their neuro-oncologist. And so I am going to uh, pause there and, and take any questions if we have time for that. Again, I apologize uh, for being a little bit late today. Thank you, Dr. Shrek. Uh, Zach Litvak from Swedish here. Great talk. We have one uh, time for one or two questions and there is one in the chat. There's a question from Muhammad Janjua, and his question is for adult gliomas that have a documented BRAF mutation, would you consider RAF, MEC, or combo therapy up front to be standard of care, or is this still a secondary therapy after initial protocols fail? I wouldn't consider it to be standard of care yet. I, I have this discussion with my patients, and I, I think um, it really comes down to a question of timing and toxicity. Um, I think the jury's still out a little bit on whether the natural history of a BRAF mutant GBM is the same or different from one that isn't. And, and so, you know, anecdotally in clinic, I have, you know, people who have all the classic markers of having a, a, an awful GBM and have lived several years longer than they should have with the BRAF mutation. Um, and, and so would I want to start those people on a BRAF inhibitor? They're going to have to field the toxicities up for several years. Will it improve their survival? Will it improve their quality of life? I'm not sure. Um, so I think it's worth talking about. I think it's an important question to answer and one that we may have some um, hints at from the pediatric literature in a few years, uh, but, but not one that I start across the board in patients. Great. Thank you for clarifying.